am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. My name is Robert Benham. I'm a retired judge and lawyer whose professional career was spent in Memphis, Tennessee. The purpose of this course was to expose people of all ages to the civil rights movement in the South that existed between the years 1955, ending with the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. In this course, we're going to see some things on the screen that are not very pleasant, but they are very, very real. I'm going to quote some language that everybody avoids today, but in the context of a quote, it's going to be a quote, and it's going to be that which people actually said. The subject matter of this course really begins in the middle 1950s, and this was the first time in the history of our country where we had a great deal of civil unrest as a result of discrimination between the races. That's what it was. We'll see what happened then, and you in your own minds can determine whether or not we have it today or whether or not we don't have it today. Now to begin all this, I have to go back to some of my background because so much of what we say and do is subjective. That is, we're all, all influenced by our lives. We may comply with what we were exposed to or we may rebel. But at any rate, many, many years ago, I was privileged to take a course in history labeled History 200, taught by one Alexander Marchant, who was probably the most brilliant professor to whom I was exposed in undergraduate school. And we all, we all can reckon back to somebody that had a real influence on our lives. Now, he's been gone low these many years, and it's just amazing what you find when you go on the internet. And lo and behold, there he is, polishing his pride, which was his antique Rolls Royce, with the ever-present cigarette in his mouth. I'll notice that. So there in Calhoun Hall, where most of the history courses were taught, I was exposed to Dr. Marchant. And there were two areas on which that he emphasized. The first is what is a primary source and what is a secondary source of history. And sometimes these are hard to distinguish. Much of what we discuss in the course will be based on secondary, that is, observations and writings of others. On the other hand, the pictorial displays and the, what I call movies, the YouTubes, uh, will be very primary. None of these will be doctored, and they will really speak for themselves. On the other hand, when we have these secondary sources, a lot of them are subjective as opposed to objective. And as I said before, we're all influenced by the history to which we've been exposed in our lives. With all this being said, I think it's important for you to know exactly where I came from and why. Prior to uh, college, my formative years were spent in Chattanooga, Tennessee. It's right on the Georgia line, 20 miles from the Alabama line. These are deep south states, and North Georgia is the ninth congressional district. And who have the people in the ninth congressional district selected to represent them in Congress today? Marjorie Taylor Greene. Marjorie Taylor Greene. <laughs> Greene. So, you know, city limits, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Go 20 miles to the left, and you go to the Alabama 5th, and guess who represents these people? And Chattanooga is a trade center, by the way. Mo Brooks. <laughs> so, 
you can see the type of people to whom I was exposed, to say the least. Uh, Chattanooka was a city of about 125,000. Uh, the city limits on the south were Georgia, as you can see. And I tried to get a picture of how that existed. And the only map I could come up with was this early map, which was really a Civil War map, where you see downtown Chattanooga and how close it is to Georgia, Lookout Mountain, Missionary Ridge. And this was the scene of really one of the turning points, battles in the Civil War because after the Battle of Chickamauga, which was fought down here, the Union Army didn't do very well, and they had to retreat back into Chattanooga. Their backs were to the Tennessee River, and the Confederates occupied Lookout Mountain, Missionary Ridge, and they were in pretty bad shape. And all of a sudden, a new general by the name of Grant got sent up there, he told a certain lieutenant with his Wisconsin volunteers to uh, advance to the base of Missionary Ridge, and the lieutenant disobeyed the orders. And he took his volunteers up Missionary Ridge. The Confederates, in their wisdom, had all their cannon pointed toward downtown Chattanooga, so they couldn't aim down the side of Missionary Ridge. And that lieutenant was named Arthur MacArthur. He was later Supreme Commander of the United States Forces in the Philippines, and his son, Douglas MacArthur. He was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, and you're gonna ask me, what does that have to do with his course? And I'm gonna tell you, <laughs> absolutely nothing. <laughs> Just nothing. But it's a little bit of trivia as to Chattanooga. Chattanooga also was a home to Rock City which is a great tourist attraction, and throughout the southeast and the whole, whole, really, eastern part of the country, their main advertising was painting barns, and they painted the roof of barns all over the eastern United States, brought thousands of people to Rock City, and they also said you could see seven states from Rock City. Well, I'm not so sure about seven, but certainly five. Uh, it was a nice view, to say the least. High school years, we're at a little school called Macaulay, which is located on the side of Missionary Ridge. It was affiliated with the Southern Presbyterian Church as opposed to the Cumberland Presbyterian USA. We had about 500 students, half of whom were boarding students, half of whom were day students. And for a small school, it, it, it graduated some people who went on to some bit of notoriety uh, on what we would call both sides of the spectrum. And, and I just selected four. Uh, I think you might well recognize Pat Robertson, the evangelical preacher. This is him in his uniform, his senior year at Macaulay. Uh, that was in the late 30s. Then a fellow by the name of Howard Baker became a senator from Tennessee two times. He was also the Senate minority leader, the Senate majority leader. And during the Watergate hearings was the one who asked the magic question of what and when, which resulted in the resignation of President Nixon. In my class, Robert Edward Ted Turner, founder of CNN. You can see him in his uniform on the left, big in the news business, to say the least. He amassed more acreage, uh, rural acreage probably, than anybody in the United States, and he's turned it all into conservation easements, much to his credit. Then, of more recent venue, uh, George handed me this book by John Meacham, John Meacham went to Macaulay. And to those of us who are news junkies, we see a lot of him. Chattanooga was very, very segregated, to say the least. Restaurants were segregated, hotels were segregated, and actually geography was segregated. And if you were either black or Jewish, and I happen to be Jewish, you couldn't live in the two most upscale areas of town because of deed restrictions. There were no black physicians to my recollection. Uh, some 
white physicians treated black patients, but they always had separate waiting rooms, one that was labeled white and one that was labeled colored, just like the buses in the front, white in the front, colored in the back. So this was kind of the atmosphere that was, I was surrounded with. Now, curiously enough, both of my parents were, and for reasons I'm not quite sure of, segregationists. My mother was actually born in Chattanooga. Her parents were immigrants from, they said, Russia. But to be more specific, and I never got a lot of details for which I uh, have never pardoned myself, uh, but it's from some little shtetl right outside of Kiev, which was in the Ukraine that we hear of today. Uh, they came to this country with two children, had two children born here. My mother was the youngest. My father and mother met in New Jersey where one of my mother's sisters was living. Uh, his father came from England. His mother came from Galicia, which was a part of Poland that got partitioned in the 1790s between Russia, Germany, and Austria. When we had domestic help, which was sporadic at best, they were referred to as, quote, they, end quote, and I'm probably going to use that a lot in this presentation, but they had to use the privy, the commode that was in the basement. They had to have separate dishes and a separate glass. They had to eat at the kitchen counter, and while they cleaned the breakfast room table and dining room table, were not allowed to sit down at the breakfast room table or dining room table up to a point. It's the way it was. And I would ask my mother why she would say they like it better that way. Well, they was my mother, not them. <laughs> at any rate, five days after high school, I was 17 years old, and in those days there was a draft and the Army had adopted a program where you could volunteer to join a reserve unit. You could go in for six months active duty, and then you were in the reserves for seven and a half years. And I celebrated my 18th birthday at Fort Jackson. This is what it looks like today. It didn't look like it in 1956. But this is what the barracks looked like in 1956. And that's where I spent six months. At Fort Jackson in those days, they had an area that was referred to as Knucklehead Colony, which is not very nice, but there were over 10,000 young men, largely from the Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Maryland area, high school graduates that couldn't read and write. <coughs> And the Army's objective in 1956 was to get them up to the fourth grade level. And in later months, uh, I was exposed to black non-coms when I was in basic training. And then later on, I was in barracks with, with a lot of people who had, quote, graduated from Knucklehead Colony. But they would ask me to read letters they had received from home. And these letters were written phonetically. And if you've ever tried to read something that's phonetics, it's a challenge. <laughs> and as I stuttered and stammered, they thought that I had about the same level of education they had. <laughs> but we all muddled through it. But at any rate, in January of 1957, I entered undergraduate work at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And for the first time, began to have interaction with blacks. It was not at Vanderbilt, but it was at what was then Tennessee A&I, now Tennessee State. And many of us would go to Keene's Little Garden, which is pictured here, which is their basketball arena, because they played run and gun basketball. And it was a lot more exciting than SEC basketball, believe me. And they sent a number of people like Skull Barnett and John Barnhill to the NBA. It was also the school that uh, 
talking about recent events, sent the first black person to the NFL who became a starting quarterback. We hear a lot about that in the news today. Going to these basketball games, you had some interaction with the students there. They were extremely welcoming to whites. I don't think the same, I know the same thing would not have happened had they come across town to Vanderbilt. But they were, and, and you know, it finally dawned on me that, you know, they were just like me. And then on one break, I w came home, and there's my mother sitting at the dining room table with Thena, who was our, we called it, maid. And that was the first time I had seen her at a dining room table. And it seems like my mother decided she was going to get a real estate license. Well, you had to have some basic math knowledge to take the test to pass it. And my mother was really good at multiplication because she had drilled my brother and I with multiplication, but she never, ever learned how to divide. <laughs> and there was Thena teaching my mother how to divide. That was a real eye-opener. Following undergraduate school and law school, plus two years working with the Treasury Department, I ended up in Memphis, Tennessee. And this is an aerial view of Memphis today. It wasn't near as nice in 1965. And at that point in time, there were probably eight black lawyers practicing in Memphis. I was with a small firm. I was a junior person. So every day, I was at the Shelby County Courthouse. And what I saw were judges who had minimal respect for the black lawyers, despite the fact that one in particular gentleman by the name of A.A. A. Ladding was as good a lawyer as there was practicing at the bar at that point in time. Also, Tennessee, unlike California, for example, did not have what you call an integrated bar. Uh, that has nothing to do with races. In California, when you pass the bar exam, you become a member of the bar. Tennessee, when you pass the bar exam, you have to join either the Tennessee Bar Association or the Chattanooga or Nashville or Knoxville or Memphis Bar Association. They were separate entities. And in that day and time, 1965, the Memphis Bar Association was segregated. The Bar Association occupied most of the, half the third floor of this courthouse with a very extensive law library. And in the, those days, one of the tools in trade of a lawyer was your law library. But none of the black lawyers were able to use the law library. And several of us expressed a little distaste, challenge, whatever you want to use, of the fact that this just doesn't, didn't seem quite fair. And because of that and some other reasons, I ended up getting fired from this law firm. Uh, and fortunately, I found a lawyer who had these substance abuse issues, and he offered me space in his office if I would cover for him, which I was glad to do, because I had free space. I didn't have any office furniture. I had a card table and four chairs. I still had that same card table. Two of the chairs were in the basement. But he had a case that he handed to me where the landlord of the 100 North Main Building, which is what it was called, uh, was trying to evict one of his clients, and the clients didn't have a whole lot of money, and he asked me to represent them, and I didn't have any money either. But I went to court and somehow prevailed, and what they did have was a surplus of office furniture. So they paid me an office furniture, and that's how I got started. <laughs> this was the same time when Racial temperatures in the early 60s were boiling, and it seemed to me at that time that there were two common grounds. One would be religion or churches, and the other would be civic organizations. Now, we had a group of young, well-dressed blacks that tried to go to the Second Presbyterian Church, and what happened, there was a book written about it, 
they were summarily charged with trespassing, taken to jail. There was no integration. Then you had civic organizations, and at that point in time, the JCs were a big civic organization in Memphis. It had been a training ground for a lot of politicians. We had well over 700 members. We decided to integrate, and nobody in the Rotary Kiwanis Exchange would speak to us for a long period of time, and I lost a lot of business. I didn't have much to lose. So. That's kind of my background. And the real challenge of this course is where do you begin? Do you go back to 1619 when slaves were first brought to this country? And bear in mind, that was only 12 years after Jamestown was founded and one year before the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock. You go back to Eli Whitney, the cotton gin, and the fact that Cotton became the leading export of the country. It's way too far to go back. So I, I looked at two major events. The pilot light for the explosion that was ignited by the spectacle of Emmett Till that we'll take up right after our break was the famous desegregation case of Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education, which was published by the U.S. Supreme Court in May of 1954. And let's get to the specifics. You've gotten a handout, and the first two cases you're going to see in there that are printed are Plessy versus Fort Ferguson that I'm going to talk about in just a second, and then the Brown case. Now, note the length of these opinions, and note the length of the opinions today. That's because you were on a regular typewriter or selectric in those days. You didn't have computers, so <laughs> even contracts tended to be a lot shorter. Wills and trusts certainly tended to be a lot shorter, but uh, that's where we are. In 1896, Homer Plessy, and this was a setup to test a Louisiana statute. Homer Plessy, who was seven-eighths white, one-eighth African-American, boarded a train traveling from two points within the state of Louisiana. And I believe this was the car, actual car, in which this occurred. Conductor told him to go to the car reserve for the colored race. He refused, was forcibly ejected by a police officer and imprisoned in jail for having violated a Louisiana statute. And I'm gonna quote that statute that all railway companies carrying passengers in their coaches in this state shall provide equal but separate accommodations for the white and colored races by providing two or more passenger coaches for each passenger train or, or by dividing the passenger coaches by a partition so as to secure separate accommodations in coaches other than the ones assigned to them on account of the race they belong to. Plessy versus Ferguson stands for what we now call separate but equal. In fact, that Supreme Court in dicta, which is language that doesn't really address the issue, but gives you some idea of the mindset of people at that time, a pine that, quote, the most common instance of this is connected with the establishment of separate schools for white and colored children, which has been held to be a valid exercise of the legislative power. As you see, he tried to get that banned, he lost, and that was the law until 1954. 1954, we had the case of Brown versus the Board of Education decided by the Warren Court, which resulted in a nine to zero decision because they felt that separate but equal didn't apply. This was a typical white school. In many areas, this was a typical black school. That carried over to Little Rock Central, beautiful building, but this was the black school in Little Rock. Thurgood Marshall argued the case for the petitioners who prevailed. In each of the cases, 
Manners of the Negro race through their legal representatives seek the aid of the courts in obtaining admission to the public schools of their community on a non-segregated basis. In each instance, they had been denied admission to schools attended by white children under laws requiring or permitting segregation to race. This segregation was alleged to deprive the plaintiffs of the equal protection of the laws under the 14th Amendment. In each of the cases, other than the Delaware case, the three-judge federal district court denied relief to the plaintiffs on the so-called separate but equal doctrine announced by this court, and it is the Supreme Court, in Plessy v. Ferguson. Under that doctrine, equality of treatment is accorded when the races are provided substantially equal facilities, even though these facilities be separate. In the Delaware case, the Supreme Court of Delaware adhered to that doctrine, but ordered that plaintiffs be admitted to white schools because of their superiority to the Negro schools. The plaintiffs contend that segregated public schools are not equal and cannot be made equal, and hence they are deprived of the equal protection of laws. Because of the obvious importance of the question presented, the court took jurisdiction, argument was heard in the 1952 term, and re-argument was heard this term on certain questions propounded by the court. The court then concluded that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently inherently unequal. Therefore, we hold that the plaintiffs and others similarly situated for whom the actions have been brought are, by reason of the segregation complained of, deprived of the equal protection of laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. This opinion set off a veritable furor in the South where organizations known as white citizens' councils were hastily formed and churches set up a set of private schools that exist to this day. In fact, in Memphis, where I spent my adult life, the racial balance of the city public schools is about 90% black, 10% white, while the racial population is 60% black and 40% white. In this regards, white flight. Now, Let's get into how Brown was received in most of the states that still had segregated schools. In Mississippi, May 17, 1954 was dubbed Black Monday. Black Monday was the subject of a speech by and a book by one Thomas Pickens Brady. Brady went north to Lawrenceville Prep, which is a very respected prep school in New Jersey, then to Yale, where he graduated in 1927, and the University of Mississippi Law School, from which he graduated in 1930. Now, say 85-90% of the lawyers practicing in Mississippi go then and up until very recent times all went to the University of Mississippi Law School. It's a pretty good law school, but the main reason was as soon as you got a law degree from Ole Miss, you were automatically admitted to the bar or to practice before the supreme and inferior courts and didn't have to take a bar exam. So everybody in Mississippi went to Ole Miss Law School. Brady actually later became Chief Justice of the Mississippi Supreme Court. And to get into his mindset, this is a quote. Members of the nation's highest tribunal may be learned in the law, but they were utterly lacking in common sense when they rendered Monday's decision. Common sense of the kind that should have told them that tragedy will inevitably follow. Human blood may stain southern soil in many places because of this decision, but the dark red stains of that blood will be on the marble steps of the United States Supreme Court building. The day that the Dutch ship landed on the sandy beach of Jamestown was the greatest day in the history of the American Negro. This resulted in now slaves to lay aside cannibalism and other barbaric customs. You can dress a chimpanzee, housebreak him, and teach him to use a knife and fork, 
but it will take countless generations of evolutionary development, if ever, before you can convince him that a caterpillar or a cockroach is not a delicacy. Likewise, the social, political, economic, and religious preferences of the Negro remain close to the caterpillar and the cockroach. This, in essence, reflects the mantra of the citizens' councils that spread throughout Mississippi and the segregated South. And now I think it's a good time to take a break. <laughs> 